Good evening. My name is Patricia Leva, President and CEO of Junior Achievement. I'm proud of the meaningful work we do every day to help prepare young people for their futures. And tonight, I have the privilege of being your host to honor four extraordinary individuals who are an inspiration to our students and to the greater community. On behalf of my partners, the Rochester Business Journal and the Rochester Museum and Science Center, welcome to the 2021 Rochester Business Hall of Fame. A small group of Hall of Fame laureates, their families and sponsors have gathered in person tonight to celebrate at the Kodak Theater in Kodak Center. And we recognize that many also are watching our induction ceremony online. Whether you are near or far, thank you for joining us. The Rochester Business Hall of Fame is a prestigious tradition. Over the past 21 years, we have carefully selected 136 individuals for this illustrious honor. Each has made outstanding contributions to our economy and our community, and each is a role model for the next generation. Tonight's inductees are no exception. For over a century and a half, the Palmer family has provided goods and services to meet our community's most basic needs, as well as employment for thousands of individuals. While doctors Jude and Ava Sauer have worked tirelessly for decades, improving the health and quality of life for millions of people around the globe. The 2021 honorees are innovators. They have proven resilient in difficult times and they are examples of what it means to find great meaning in their work and in serving this community. For many of us, our lives and circumstances have changed dramatically since early 2020. The way we interact with one another, the choices we make with our finances, the meaning we look for in our work, and even our outlook of the future. In June of this year, with the support of Ernst & Young, Junior Achievement undertook a global evaluation of over 5,000 young people who have been through JA programs focused on financial literacy, work readiness, and entrepreneurship. We were encouraged to learn how optimistic the next generation is about their futures. More than 80% felt hopeful about finding meaning in their work. They shared excitement around opportunities that allowed them to innovate and solve social problems. 75% of students said that career exploration was one of the most important subjects in their education. And 65% of students reported their ideal career would be starting their own business from the ground up. At the same time, however, many American teenagers reported a lack of understanding about how money, investing, and the economy works. And we're looking for more opportunities to obtain these critical skills for their future success. Please welcome tonight's presentation of What I Want to Do When I Grow Up. When I grow up. I don't want to live paycheck to paycheck. I don't want to cry when paying the bills. When I grow up. I don't want to be turned down for a business loan. I don't want to borrow a lot for an education. And then not know what to do with it. When I grow up, I don't want to be paid less. Told I'm underqualified. Or overqualified. When I grow up. When I grow up. I want to know how to save for my future. Find a job I like. And start my own business. When I grow up. I want to know how to provide for my family. And invest in my community. And make a difference. When I grow up. When I grow up. When I grow up. When I grow up. I just want things to be different. I would ask all of us to consider that one of the most important things we can do at this time is equip our young people with the kind of skills and behaviors we come here tonight to celebrate. Financial capability, entrepreneurial thinking, resiliency to navigate uncertain times, and the importance of meaning in the work we choose. Let's take a moment to hear from one of our local students. Hi, my name is Janae. I am a senior in high school. I had the unique opportunity to work for Junior Achievement this past summer as a part of the Bank of America Student Leaders Program. Going through middle and high school, I didn't have many opportunities to do a lot of career exploration, 
and I also wasn't required to take a personal finance course. I had the opportunity to engage in some of these JA programs during my time there this summer. And now I wish I had more of these experiences throughout my education. Rochester is one of the most impoverished cities in the nation and living on the west side of the city, I see this poverty every day. I think if more students were educated on the jobs that existed or the importance of education to get higher paying jobs and provide mentors to help encourage them and show them that they can do it, I think this would go a long way to helping end the cycle of poverty in our city. I also don't think people understand how important it is to have mentors that can help show you the way. When I was growing up, my mom worked as a probation officer. She helped people fix their mistakes and lead a productive life. Over the years, I witnessed several people walk up to her in public, thanking her for helping them overcome their challenges. Some would even start crying. It was an inspiration. My mom could change so many people's lives and they respected her for it. I'm not exactly sure what I wanna be when I grow up, but I know that every experience I have and every person I meet increases my confidence and inspires me to be better. I'm thinking I would like to work in politics someday, maybe as a lawyer, advocating as a prosecutor, or perhaps working on a political campaign and contributing to public policy. What do I wanna be when I grow up? The possibilities are endless. I know that I want to make a difference in our community. Thank you, Janae. JA is proud to have been your host for the Bank of America Student Leaders Program this past summer. We are grateful to Bank of America, which for many years has provided Junior Achievement with the financial and volunteer support that bring lessons in economic mobility into our schools. Tonight, Bank of America also serves as the presenting sponsor of the virtual Rochester Business Hall of Fame induction ceremony. I would like to invite Colleen Madison, president of Bank of America in Rochester, to say a few words. Good evening. My name is Colleen Madison, president of Bank of America in Rochester. I am proud to be here with you this evening celebrating this year's Rochester Business Hall of Fame honorees. Janae, you've made us so proud. You have a bright future ahead of you and good luck in your senior year. Thank you to Patty Leva, her staff, board members, volunteers, and corporate sponsors. Thank you for the positive impact you have all made in our community. Bank of America has proudly been a longtime sponsor of the Rochester Business Hall of Fame and a supporter of Junior Achievement. Through the Rochester Business Hall of Fame, we honor those individuals whose innovation, leadership, and inspiration have fueled economic growth and prosperity for all. At Bank of America, an important focus of ours is advancing pathways to economic mobility through workforce development and education to help build equitable, thriving communities. Junior achievement programs play an important role in our region's efforts in doing just that. These programs empower students with the tools and knowledge to become financially capable, helping them build skills for 21st century jobs and inspire them to become Rochester's next generation of leaders. Our young people need to understand how hard work like that of this year's inductees will result in the rewards of self-sufficiency. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Thank you, Colleen. Prior to the start of the program, you had the opportunity to see the photos and names of each member of the Rochester Business Hall of Fame scrolling on the screen. This year, Monroe County will celebrate its bicentennial, its 200th year. The Rochester Business Hall of Fame is home to many business and social entrepreneurs who started right here in the 19th century. Their innovation and resilience paved the way for economic expansion in this region and provided a path for future generations to follow. And while we celebrate this past tonight, we also look to the future. Ben Jacobs, associate publisher and editor of the Rochester Business Journal, 
sat down with two current members of the Rochester Business Hall of Fame who have worked tirelessly to secure a brighter future for our community and the next generation. Good evening, everyone. The RBJ is proud to bring you daily business news that reflects both the history and the future of our community. And we're especially honored to be part of the extraordinary Business Hall of Fame tradition. I'm here with Rick Dorschel, former president and owner of the Dorschel Automotive Group and a 2007 inductee into the Rochester Business Hall of Fame. Thank you for joining me today, Rick. Thanks for having me, Ben. Resilience is closely linked to adaptability, uh, growth mindset, and the ability to bounce back. After decades in business, can you share some of your secrets to resiliency? Secrets to resiliency, I, I would say it probably starts with a regular regimen of red wine. Uh, and maybe a little exercise, and, uh, and I think most importantly, to be happy with your life and your business career and the people that you work with and around. You know, I think if you're, if you're engaged mentally and you're enjoying what you do, resiliency is something you don't even think about. You know, it, it happens to be there every morning when you throw the switch. Oh, that's wonderful. What innovation do you see for the, the future of the automotive industry? Boy, you caught me on the right day. I mean, I think everything is up for grabs in our industry. All the things we, we used to understand, uh, carrying 60, 90 days worth of inventory, when I look in the backyard today, and we may not have seven, eight, nine days of inventory. Now, it's beautiful for not having to pay floor plan, but it's a disaster for people wanting to select color and equipment and, and pick the model that they've been dreaming about for the last three or four years. So I think inventory is going to be very different. I think we probably will become a, a, a mail order business. I, I think people will be willing to wait six to eight weeks to get a car as opposed to going out in the lot and walking and picking something they can take home this afternoon. We are certainly going to be driving golf carts, not, not high-powered automobiles with, with uh, internal combustion engines. Uh, you know, I can't drive a car with enough horsepower, and I think that's probably very, very old thinking. We're going to have uh, wonderful cars that are going to weigh half what the current car weighs. Uh, maintenance is going to be a matter of replacing an electric motor. Uh, I think all the other features and benefits we're used to are going to be there. These electric cars, by the way, are very fast. If you like acceleration and performance, you're not going to give anything up by driving an electric car. But I think uh, when I think about our industry, uh, two-thirds of our revenue comes from parts and service and body shop and things, used cars, unrelated to that new car. Uh, event, that new car experience. Uh, I'm not sure what it looks like, but I think the parts and service support will be less necessary. So I think a complete overhaul of what we know of today is the franchise system and, and the new car industry. All different. Things have obviously changed, but you know, you were doing this for a long time. Obviously before the pandemic, you had a lot of success keeping those employees over the years. What have you done throughout your career to keep employees motivated and engaged and, and wanting to stay with you for the 25, 30 years that you mentioned? Well, the obvious things are simple, you know, raw pay, uh, environment, uh, situation, communications, respect, asking them about their families, knowing what's going on in their families, being there to assist them if, if there is crisis or, or loss in a family. You know, I, in most cases I knew spouses' names, uh, I knew kids. I was always, I was always making them smaller than they really were. You know, that five-year-old who's now 14. But, you know, walking around, talking to people. MBWA, management by walking around. I never had an MBA, but I think I was good at the MBWA one. You know, and nothing is more important than, than people looking into your eyes, knowing what's going on in your life, what's going on in theirs. And by the way, have you had any thoughts about how we can make this thing better? You know, how's paper flow? You know, uh, what about our whatever our flat rate allocations? Are they fair? Should we be talking to the manufacturer about getting a better allowance on, on some of this warranty work that we're doing? But it all comes down to communications. It comes down to knowing who that person is, uh, who works with you under your roof, uh, knowing what their needs are, listening, asking enough questions, being not afraid to ask a question that might come back as, you're not paying me enough, boss, and it's, it's more important now than ever. You know, we now have stay interviews, not interviews to hire, but interviews to stay. The auto industry, especially in Rochester, is uh, filled with local entrepreneurs, and research shows that many young people would someday like to start their own business. And what can we do in Rochester to help foster this entrepreneurial spirit and prepare youth for its challenges and its risks? 
Boy, that's, that's an easy one. That's a softball. Junior achievement. You know, education is to, is to open people's minds, to share ideas. I think business needs to be visiting high schools. Business needs to be visiting grade schools and talking to kids about what we do every day and why we do it and how much we love it and how committed we are to it, how much fun it is and what it can mean for a family, what it can mean for a community. You raise everybody out of poverty, get wonderful jobs where everybody can own a home, have a car, have good medical care, have, have time with their families. But I think it's just that. This is an economic issue. And when the haves and have nots are too far apart, we're going to have problems. When we narrow that gap, things get better. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Rick, for sharing your thoughts with us this evening. Ben will be back a little later in our program, but now I'd like to welcome Hillary Olson, President and CEO of the Rochester Museum and Science Center, to review the criteria and selection process for tonight's prestigious honor. Thank you, Patty. The Rochester Museum and Science Center is also grateful to be a part of this prestigious award, and we are proud to be the home to the Rochester Business Hall of Fame exhibit, which showcases the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit of all of our laureates to hundreds and thousands of visitors annually. I hope that you will join us at the museum in the months ahead to learn more about the membership of this illustrious group. The museum also provides research support to the Rochester Business Hall of Fame Advisory Committee, an independent group of business leaders and current laureates who make annual recommendations to a selection committee. The committee considers the following qualifications. First, inductees must have made a significant and enduring contribution and positive impact on their organization or their industry. Second, the inductee must have an excellent reputation and be a source of inspiration and encouragement for others to follow, especially our next generation. And third, inductees must have made a significant contribution to their community. As you can see, the process for selection into the Rochester Business Hall of Fame is a rigorous one. And I'm sure you will agree that tonight's honorees certainly exceed these criteria. Now let me introduce our first inductees of the 2021 class of the Rochester Business Hall of Fame. More than 170 years ago, Levi Palmer opened a storefront at the Center Market on Front Street in Rochester. As the business grew and expanded, it became known as the Palmer Fish Company and the foundation for what is now over a billion dollar enterprise. The modest retailer was passed down through two generations and then in 1951, Dwight S. Palmer, known as Bud, took the reins. Dwight M. Palmer, known as Kip, began working at the company in the retail store at the age of 14. And in 1975, with a bachelor's degree in political science and economics, Kip chose to forego graduate school and join the family business full time. And this was the beginning of a significant growth story. Over the next 20 years, and until Bud's passing in 1997, the two acquired more than a handful of companies, transforming itself into a premier one-stop shop for independent restaurants, healthcare, K-12 schools, colleges and universities, and regional restaurant chains. The most significant of these acquisitions came in 1988 with the purchase of the Syracuse-based food redistribution company, GNC Foods which today alone employs more than 400 associates, stocks over 4,000 products, and serves thousands of distributors, both nationally and internationally. In 2009, to honor its humble retail beginnings, Kip opened Palmer's Direct to You Market, which through his leadership and entrepreneurial spirit has grown into a multi-million dollar enterprise of its own. The ultimate hallmark of success, however, for both Bud and Kip, has been living the golden rule of treating people as they would want to be treated. Palmer Associates share in the profit of the company and 10% of the company's bottom line is donated to charity annually. Kip gives his time and treasure to many charitable organizations in our community, including Roberts Wesleyan College and Northeastern Seminary, the Seneca Waterways Boy Scouts of America, the YMCA and Lifetime Assistance to name a few. My father went to the Harvard Business School 
and received his MBA on the GI Bill, and in 1948 went in the family business, which is kind of crazy because in 1948, with a Harvard MBA, you could have done almost anything you wanted to do, but he went in the family business. When my father came in the business, we were one of the smallest seafood companies in Rochester, New York. The actual name of the company is Palmer Fish Company. We were almost exclusively retail, very, very little wholesale. And my father came into the business at the time that food service really started to happen in this country. And my father changed the course of the business from being a small retailer to a wholesaler. So what my father did is my father recognized what we needed to do in order to survive and basically made it happen. So I had been with the company approximately six months. And my father called me up to his office. And my father was, you know, an executive, right? I mean, coat, tie, suit. So I go up to his office, smelling like a mackerel, and uh, said, Dad, what's going on? I got all these trucks to load, I gotta put up orders, uh, all right. Son, your mother and I have made enough money in this business that we could probably sell the business, liquidate the assets, okay, and we could live the rest of our lives. But that's not what we wanna do. We like the business to pass to another generation. But we need to know. So I'm gonna give you a year to decide one way or the other whether you're going to come in the business or not come in the business. If you tell me that you're coming in the business, you're condemned. You will be here for the rest of my natural life. <laughs> 12 months pass. I hear the loudspeaker. Kip Palmer, report to my office. Kip Palmer, report to my office. He says, son, it's been a year. What's your decision? <laughs> So I paused and I said, I'll stay on one condition. And he said, what's the condition? I said, we have to move. We're working out of an alley. Yes, the, yes, it's paid for, but we need another distribution center. We're handling product way too many times before it gets to the client. He said, son, you've got a deal. And he shook my hand and he gave me a hug. And that's the condemned story but I haven't been condemned, I've been blessed. Kip's been in, in the industry for such a long period of time. I think he knows every aspect of the business. I think that's one of his uh, good traits. Uh, he's done probably everything from buying beef to driving trucks to cutting fish. And uh, I think it makes him for a well-rounded leader with that much experience. The company sort of speak for themselves with the history starting out um, as Palmer starting out as a fish retailer and turning into a uh, broadline food service distributor that sells everything under the sun that a restaurant would buy. And for GNC, it started out as a meat company, beef only, and now um, carries 5,000 products over a variety of different things. But his entrepreneurial spirit, I think, drives the organization because he always forces us to think differently. He's got a vision, uh, he's got tenacity. He uh, understands the finances that are involved in making a business work for the long haul. But as I look at what has really, from my perspective, made him such, such a success and, and unique, is he understands people. You know, if you look at examples of the impact that Kip's involvement has had with our organization and our brand, it first and foremost starts with just the overall demand that Kip and his team have created for certified Angus beef in every area of the country where he touches. Uh, beyond that, you know, Kip's perspective as a, as a food service professional in the restaurant industry, um, he brought that to our board of directors. And keep in mind, our board of directors is made up of, of cattlemen, folks who raise cattle for a living, do it every day. And Kip gives us that balance from one end of the production system clear to the other. Kip is compassionate, he's driven, he is able to fly at 20,000 feet as well as get into the weeds on a day-to-day -day basis. 
He's able to pivot very quickly. He can jump from being the board member of a large nonprofit to asking about labor hours spent on third shift selecting cases uh, within the matter of seconds. Um, his vast knowledge of the food service uh, industry is unmatched and uh, he's a great teacher for somebody like me coming up into the business and trying to learn very rapidly. Kip has been involved at Robertson Northeastern as a board member for 23 years and involved in the community longer than that because his father was also connected. He became involved because he was invited by a previous president to see what Roberts had to offer. And he fell in love with Roberts. And that's what he tells me. He fell in love with the students, with the innovative spirit, with the faith grounding that we have as a faith-based institution. But I think the things that Kip has done for the community are not always seen. There is a silent way in which he has given, and he gives philanthropically, he gives of his time to new businesses and to people that come and ask him questions. And that, I think, is probably one of the greatest strengths that he has. He's not looking for recognition. As a matter of fact, he tends to shy away from that. And I'm so excited that he's being honored in this way. There are few people that you meet that speak life into you and can do that in a way that is energizing and challenging and pushes you forward. Kip Palmer is absolutely that person. Ladies and gentlemen, the Rochester Business Hall of Fame welcomes the late Dwight W. Palmer and Dwight M. Palmer to its ranks. Thank you to the Rochester Business Hall of Fame for recognizing my father, Bud, and me for this honor. In my case, I'm not sure I'm deserving to be in the company of such a distinguished group of past honorees. I've been truly blessed in my life. I give God all the glory. Throughout my life, I've been surrounded by great people who set the right examples for me. My family, friends, co-workers and business associates. As I reflect on my life, I know that God guided me and provided for me in the best of times and the toughest of times. I'm very thankful for the support of our wonderful clients, vendors, employee associates, and the Rochester community. Without their support, we would not be where we are today. I also want to recognize my family and thank them for their love and support, especially my wife, Amy. Again, thank you for this honor. We're also here tonight with Rick Plimpton, CEO of Optimax Systems Inc. and a Rochester Business Hall of Fame Class of 2018 inductee. Thanks for joining us today, Rick. Thank you, appreciate the opportunity to be here. You were recently selected as an Aspen Institute Job Quality Fellow and have been referred to as a thought partner on strategies to build better jobs for America's workers. Can you talk about the strategy of implementing the Employee Ownership Trust and why you did that at Optimax? When Mike Mandina, my business partner, and I started thinking about succession for the business, um, none of the conventional ways to sell a business really resonated for us. The simplest thing for a business owner to do is, you know, clean up your financials and sell to the highest bidder. But we wanted to find a solution that provided 100 years of prosperity, or at least the potential for that, kept the business ownership local, and ensured that profits will always be shared with the employees. For, since 1996, we've been sharing 25% of our profits with our employees each month. And we believe that's a key part of our success, honoring every team member and making sure that we pay them a fair wage. You, you've said that employee ownership is a evolution of capitalism. What else do you believe needs to evolve? We live in a world today where leveraging technology 
Um, it's not like it was years ago where it, data was collected, put into reports, and then shared with upper management or the leaders, and then the leaders made decisions and, and those decisions were, were baked down through the organization. Today, using technology, we can collect information and through dashboards or other means, we can get that information out to everyone in the, in the company in real time. And, and people can be making decisions in the work centers. And that's where the best decisions are made because they know how the work's get, being done. If you think about people that are working in management, they probably knew how that work was done 10 or 20 years ago when they were out there on the production floor, but they're, they're not up to speed on what the latest methods and processes are. So Mike and I have always believed that the best way to create solutions and innovation, greater efficiency, is to get the people involved that are actually doing the work. What advice would you give to companies who are looking to provide meaningful work and prosperity for employees? It, it really it starts with honoring the employees, respecting their opinions, their views, their perspective, um, making sure that they're rewarded fairly for the value that they're providing. And these are things that we try to do at Optimax. Optimax is celebrating a big anniversary this year, the 30 years. What's next for you and the company? Yeah, it's, uh, it was really fun in August. We celebrated our, our 30th anniversary. Um, it's, it's just incredible where we are today at nearly 400 employees. When I joined Mike and Optimax in 1995, it was, it was about 10 people struggling to make weekly payroll in this little startup company manufacturing precision optics for research and industry. And when I asked Mike, what does success look like? He said, if we could ever grow this to 40 people, you know, we're there. <laughs> and uh, like I say, we're close to 400 employees now. We've averaged 25% revenue growth per year through the years, and we're still growing at that rate. Um, just before the pandemic hit, we completed an expansion that doubled the size of our facility. And we were thinking that would kind of keep us in good stead until like 2030 and then, you know, do another expansion. But we've, we've been very fortunate through the pandemic. Um, we are an essential business. We've been very busy and uh, we're, we've already filled up that, that additional space that we added in, in 2019-2020. So uh, we're looking at breaking ground next year to potentially double the size of our facility again. You've talked a lot about uh, the growth at Optimax and, and how it's grown not only in revenue but also in employees and had to expand and are likely to have to expand again soon. And I know Optimax has a, a strong internal workforce development program. I know the region has a, a robust ecosystem for the photonics industry. Despite that, there's a lot of unfilled jobs in that, in that industry. And, um, you know, a lot's been written and talked about for the skills gap in these professions. What skills do you think are needed in today's workplace in this industry? I think that it's no longer okay just to have um, basic fundamental skills. You really need problem solving skills for many of the new jobs. You know, jobs that are, or mm, functions that are, do you know, repeat, 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 um, those can be automated but functions that need problem solving, that's where you know, people are gonna be needed to take a look at the situation from different perspectives and, and figure out better ways to do that work or a different way to do it that's maybe more efficient or more precise. Um, so there, there will be, as, as we adopt new technology, whether it's automation or, or data, database management, um, it will empower employees to be more productive. At Optimax, I, I challenge our leadership not to um, not just to train our new employees to, to, so that they're proficient, but to make sure we're nurturing and training them so that by the time they've been with us for five years, they are they are creating value at a level that they're worthy of twenty-five dollars an hour or more. In this region, twenty-five dollars an hour, fifty thousand a year—that's roughly the living wage. Everybody. Everybody should be trained at a level that they're able to earn at least fifty thousand uh, dollars within a few years. What do the next thirty years look like for Optimax? So here's one way to put that in perspective. Optimax was founded in 1991, so we just celebrated our 30th anniversary. In the first 30 years of business, Optimax generated 500 million dollars in revenue, and roughly half of that was shared to, with our workforce through payroll benefits and bonuses. In the next 30 years, Optimax will generate over $5 billion in revenue. 
and roughly half of that will be shared with our workforce. Two and a half billion dollars that will be spent in the community at auto dealerships, Wegmans, wherever they spend their money, invested for retirement. And that's how you strengthen a community. Small businesses that stay locally owned and share the wealth with the employees. Thank you, Ben. And thank you, Rick, for sharing your thoughts with us. And now I'm proud to introduce our next inductees. With an innovative spirit and determined commitment, Drs. Jude and Ava Sauer have spent the last three decades dedicated to improving the outcomes of surgical patients. During his surgical residency at the University of Rochester Medical Center in 1986, Dr. Jude Sauer founded their company, now called LSI Solutions, with the goal to innovate new technology and techniques toward improving the effectiveness of surgery while reducing its invasiveness. Dr. Ava Sauer, an Austrian-born and educated medical doctor, met Jude while they were researchers at URMC in 1987. The business, which started out as an endeavor to use laser light to weld living tissue wounds, has transformed into a world-renowned surgical device company. With Rochester as the base for the research, development, manufacturing, and marketing of their innovations, LSI has had a positive impact on the outcomes of surgical patients in over 64 countries, treating over a million patients. With more than 230 US and international patents, Jude's inventions have led to many product advances, winning numerous awards, including three International Medical Design Excellence Awards. Jude has authored over 35 scientific publications and was chosen as the 2001 Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, the 2003 Rochester Intellectual Property Law Association Inventor of the Year, and was the recipient of the prestigious University of Rochester Hutchinson Medal for Outstanding Achievement and Notable Service in 2020. In addition to being a published scientific author, Ava's role has evolved from being a hands-on principal investigator in surgical research to leading the strategy of the growing corporation. As part of their mission to advance global healthcare, LSI Solutions has supported over 20 cardiac surgery research fellowship relationships with medical centers at leading universities in Blackpool, England, Vienna, Austria, Leipzig, and Berlin, Germany, and also in Durham at Duke and in Philadelphia at the Lackenau Medical Center. LSI is most proud of its largest and most accomplished research fellowship program right here at the University of Rochester Medical Center. LSI is Drew Neva and it's a organization built on Jude's genius and the couple's genius to uh, uh, build a business. But uh, what uh, LSI does is uh, formulate innovative surgical devices, tools that we as surgeons can use to improve what we do, to make what we do more efficient, to make what we do uh, safer. We have over 100 unique products now. Uh, some of those products are focused on general surgery, uh, sewing devices and gynecological surgery, and uh, also our cardiac surgery product line. We've gone from a research-based organization with anywhere from 30 to 80 employees up to now 400 employees focused on product development. Uh, we've grown from roughly three active buildings to now more than seven buildings, uh, and our campus has grown from 30 acres to over 60 acres. The product for cardiac surgeons that is most useful is this device called the Coronat. Forever and ever, sutures have been tied by hand. And it's a very effective methodology, but it means that the space that you, you, that you have to have in order to tie a suture has to be big enough for basically two hands, but certainly one hand to fit in. LSI turned that on its head 
by creating a mechanical device that would enable suturing or not completion without hand tying. It enables us to do uh, very tiny incisions and still get secure knot tying. And then it turns out, and this should be no surprise because it's a reproducible thing as opposed to uh, an art every time you tie a knot, the knots turned out to be better. I mean, that's actually turned out to be an outcome improver as well. Jude and Ava natively are incredibly intelligent people with a very gifted vision. I, I like to make a joke in sports references. They constantly see the whole field. Ava looks at the concept on you know, the administrative side of the business and is able to say, okay, where are we today with our modeling? Where are we with our strategic planning? And how do I help provide for the resource management oversight implementation so that Jude's creativity on the product and process innovation can get implemented and be sustainable. And that's where Jude's creativity brilliance and Ava's administrative brilliance really come together and they are such a powerful team uh, for LSI solutions. There's been instances where literally we'll, we'll come to work early in the morning and it's before normal work time uh, and we'll, we'll design and work with uh, Dr. Sauer, Dr. Jude Sauer directly and we'll work for hours and develop new products by the close of business, which could be five or six o'clock at night. But then Dr. Sauer has a device that he has in his hands that he can play with at night and he will stay up all night doing it and come back in the morning with a design change that'll make it better. And the team starts all over again and does it all over again. Uh, where most companies will spend months developing a product on the computer screen over three or four months, LSI can do it in a matter of hours. I mean, they started with nothing and have built an amazing uh, international business that um, that does good for people all over the world. You know, that what they do is they s help save people's lives. And Jude and Ava also are always trying to make things better and better so that uh, surgeons can do a, a better job of what they do. I mean, I'm sure he could do this from anywhere, what he does, uh, but he chose to stay in Rochester and build his business here. Jude and Ava decided I'm guessing about 15 years ago that they would fund a research position in our division on an annual basis for somebody in our surgery program or our cardiac surgery residency program that wanted to take a year out from training and do research. That's a very big commitment from the two of them from our division, from that resident or, or fellow who decides to do it. But it's resulted in us uh, doing a lot of surgical device uh, research and outcomes research and published a lot of information that's promoted the University of Rochester to a position where we're internationally known in, in, in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. They've taken that kernel of an idea and a decision to be sort of non-traditional in the practice of medicine and have built an enormous company. Uh, they've given back to the community. Uh, they're doing everything in the manufacturing cycle, right? From, from thinking of different product ideas, doing the research, doing the development, getting the approvals, manufacturing, distributing, marketing. Uh, that They are doing everything one could possibly do in business and they're doing it with great uh, focus and great vision and, and great plans for the future. We talk almost every day, or at least several times a week, and, and, and we're walking out of the st structure, and he turns to me and says, you know, Peter, I don't really care much about the trappings of wealth, but I, I really love having a good machine shop. And that really speaks to, uh, to what Jude is about. He doesn't, he doesn't, he's not flamboyant, neither one of them are. If you came across them, you wouldn't know whether they were middle class, upper class, whatever, in terms of wealth. He, it, it's, it's his, both of their commitment to actually the bottom line of LSI, which is helping patients. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jude Sauer and Dr. Ava Sauer into the Rochester Business Hall of Fame. Hello, I'm Ava Sauer. And I'm Jude Sauer. 
we are extremely honored and flattered to be inducted into the Rochester Business Hall of Fame. It is humbling to be associated with such successful and historic luminaries. Congratulations to fellow 2021 inductees, Bud and Kip Palmer. LSI Solutions has been our family business for over a third of a century. It is very clear to us that we would not be here today without the collective dedication and hard work of our enthusiastic employees over the decades. We would like to offer special thanks to Junior Achievement of Rochester, along with the Rochester Business Journal and the Rochester Museum and Science Center. We truly appreciate the support, insight, and diligence of our many amazing colleagues, friends, collaborators, counselors, and customers, surgeons and patients alike, who have put their faith in us. We especially want to thank our company's strategic leaders, Bob Bartz and Jim Gulzo, remarkable professionals through thick and thin. Our heartfelt love and appreciation goes out to our gifted children, Jude, Vinnie, Martin, and Ava. You did not volunteer for this wonderful roller coaster ride. Jude incorporated the company in 1986 when he was a University of Rochester Medical Center surgical intern. He had invented an automated optical system to deliver precise controlled laser light to weld living tissue together. We started working together after a chance meeting in a research lab at Strong in 1987. We were both medical doctors doing research between clinical training. Jude grew up in the small town of Lancaster, New York. He did his undergraduate degree in German literature, medical school and surgical residency at the University of Rochester. I was born and raised in Vienna, Austria, graduating from medical school at the University of Vienna. I came to the University of Rochester on a research fellowship. While we both always wanted to help people by providing and improving health care, neither Jude nor I ever had any intentions to pursue a career in business while growing up. We never anticipated that building a business around inventions would take us here. From its quiet start as a means to obtain NIH grant funding, LSI Solutions now has over 400 fantastic employees with a main headquarters in Victor, New York, and a new subsidiary corporation based in Dusseldorf, Germany. Our locally manufactured products have helped over 1 million patients in 64 countries, with almost 3,000 more patients added each week. Some LSI products remain within the patient throughout their lives. More than 12 million such products are already in patients, with over 45,000 more added each week. While some LSI products are reusable, most are sold as already sterile, single patient use products. At this time, our primary market focus is on helping cardiac surgery patients. We also provide innovative products for gynecologic, bariatric, general, and urologic surgery. Our primary product design intention is to make surgery more reliable and less invasive. While surgery should be faster and easier for the surgical team, our most important goal is to offer technology and techniques towards optimized patient outcomes. We strive to couple the proven benefits of surgery, often the best and most durable therapy, with minimized post-operative pain and prompt return to normal activities. This somewhat unique business model that we somehow stumbled upon has been our privilege to lead. We are extremely grateful for the support of our exciting team, our colleagues, friends, and lovely family for this opportunity to passionately pursue this worthy mission. Thank you again, Junior Achievement, Rochester Business Journal, and Rochester Museum and Science Center. And thank all of you for bestowing upon us the honor of being included into the Rochester Business Hall of Fame.
Congratulations to the 2021 class of the Rochester Business Hall of Fame. We thank you for your contributions to our economy and our community. Before we close, I'd like to acknowledge each of our sponsors this evening, including Bank of America, Palmer Food Services, and Tompkins Bank of Castile. Also, a very special thank you goes out to our friends at Flynn, who spent countless hours producing this virtual event. Thank you, Kevin, Chris, and Katie Flynn, John Marionetti, Drew Damtoft, and Craig Henderberg for bringing our celebration to life. Your years of dedication to our laureates and to the mission of JA is much appreciated. I also want to thank our Rochester Business Hall of Fame Advisory Committee members for their continued dedication and year-round support of this prestigious tradition. I hope that tonight's ceremony inspires you to notice unfilled needs, to get involved, and to have hope for our future. And perhaps most of all, I hope you will share Junior Achievement's belief in the boundless potential of young people. Because no matter their background, they can follow in the footsteps of the men and women of the Rochester Business Hall of Fame. Good night.